Thank you, Tom. And thanks to the organizers for having me. Uh, it's a shame I can't come to visit and give this talk in person, um, but I'm excited to tell, about, tell you about it nonetheless. So uh, I'm gonna be talking about doing kind of electronic structure on today's devices, so, and the best that we could possibly do. And I'm gonna try to give this talk from the perspective of uh, more of like an experimentalist perspective, uh, even though I'm a theorist, uh, in hopes that you have some takeaways of, from this that will make your experiments better when you go and run on these devices. Um, and so I also hope that you get an idea of what performance to expect uh, when, uh, you can, when you run on our devices as we open them up into the future. Okay, so uh, let's get started. So those of you who've seen me give talks before on NIST chemistry uh, probably have seen this slide. I like to update it periodically, and James had a kind of similar slide uh, where he pulled uh, kind of the big flagship experiments from the field. And this isn't all of the experiments that I've done or that have been done on devices, um, but it's a large swath of them. And what I wanted to point out with this is that most of these experiments are fewer than uh, six qubits. And even with air mitigation strategies, they are kind of barely reaching the accuracies one would need to do uh, quantitative predictive chemistry. And uh, you know, in chemistry, we have this nice benchmark chemical accuracy that uh, is some notion of accuracy that you could get from a thermodynamics type experiment like calorimetry. Um, but this isn't this isn't to criticize me pointing this out about these experiments isn't to criticize them. It's mostly to point out that th this isn't a turnkey technology. It's not easy to do these simulations like it is doing classical uh, chemistry simulations. So with that in mind, uh, one of the things that we think about a lot at Google, at least in terms of NISC simulation, is are we on a path to chemical simulation advantage with these devices? And kind of a more basic version of that is, is beyond classical physics or chemical simulation even possible? And so that's kind of the guiding force since our 2019 uh, paper, which is colloquially termed the supremacy experiment. And since then, we've done a handful of works that kind of pushed in different directions for using these devices uh, in terms of calibration or condensed matter physics and so on. And each of these is probing kind of important areas, at least uh, from my perspective. Uh, we're learning which strategies will work best, namely efficient circuits for various uh, tasks, uh, robust and extensible air mitigation and things like that. Uh, the nice thing about some of these newer experiments is that they're providing holistic benchmarks for the device that don't necessarily have all of the symmetries of a random circuit. So you can get away with a lot of, uh, with well, quite a lot when you have a random circuit. Um, but when actual you run an actual algorithm, uh, these have a lot more structure. And so it's good to provide benchmarks that actually have that structure to really test out your device. And then ultimately, we want to understand um, how far are we some, from something that's classically intractable uh, and actually run this? So from this talk, uh, I kind of broke it down into three areas. Um, one, I'll try to motivate what we do in this, this particular experiment, which is a VQE experiment. Uh, I'll try to tell you how we actually do the calibration and how we thought about that. And then all in performance. So when you run your device or when you run your experiments, you get some idea of what to expect. Uh, and then at the end, uh, I kind of want to summarize this in terms of the all-in performance that we can actually start looking at chemistry, though not quite the full um, interacting electron chemistry picture. Okay, so let's zoom out for a second and consider some of the best strategies for simulating chemistry on uh, NISC or fault-tolerant devices. Uh, let's consider, like Nathan was talking about, a Trotter uh, simulation of a Hamiltonian. Uh, so. The hardest part about doing one of these simulations is implementing this V term here, which is a two-body uh, interaction that represents the Coulomb interaction between electrons. And so this four-mode operator, uh, one of the best strategies for implementing it uh, is actually to express this as a sum of squares. Uh, this is commonly done in electronic structure. It goes by other names like density fitting, or uh, there's kind of variations of it that are called THC. Uh, and kind of the thing about this is that once you implement these sum of squares terms, you get a repeating circuit pattern. Namely, you get a single particle basis transformation followed by a charge charge network, and then you repeat that structure over and over again. So uh, the thing uh, that that's like that that's what I'm actually going to call a algorithmic primitive. This kind of repeating circuit structure. Uh, and we want to kind of keep these in mind as we are picking 
uh, future electronic structure simulations on devices. You can also do this for unitary couple cluster, uh, but I won't get into that. So another kind of best in class strategy that we're going to need to use for VQE experiments is measuring the energy, right? And uh, the best that we know how to do is actually partition your Hamiltonian, which is a four mode operator, uh, into different basis lo or local single particle bases, such that the terms in that basis are diagonal. So what we do is, again, we do something like a Cholesky decomposition on all of our terms, uh, and we can write our Hamiltonian as sum of diagonal operators, but in different bases. And so what this means is that you would do your VQE experiment, or during the course of your VQE experiment, you'd run your circuit, and then at the end, you'd rotate into one of these single particle bases and then measure, and that would give you all of the diagonal terms. So with that in mind, uh, it's kind of maybe clear, hopefully, that there's kind of a couple of circuit primitives that we could pick for our first experiment. One would be this charge-charge network, right, for implementing kind of a JASTRO type interaction, and the other is a basis transformation. And so I kind of view these as very basic primitives of electronic structure simulation. And so what we're going to choose is this basis rotation circuit primitive. And we're going to do this in a VQE fashion. There's actually lots of ways to do this. Um, as um, others were speaking about earlier, since basis rotations are quadratic, are generated by quadratic Hamiltonians, there you can fast forward them. And so you could do this in a phase estimation fashion. Um, but we're going to do this in a VQE fashion uh, because if you use phase estimation, you have to use more tricks and it kind of is moving farther away from the performance of the device. So the actual basis transformation that I'm talking about for uh, those who do uh, less chemistry uh, is a single particle basis rotation, namely I'm rotating the uh, basis of a single particle Hilbert space. And I'm denoting that here in first quantization where I'm taking some set of orthogonal molecular orbitals and I'm writing new a new linear combination of them. So in second quantization, uh, as I said, this basis rotation is actually generated by a Hamiltonian that's quadratic in many body order. And so uh, the nice thing about this is that we have very simple linear depth circuit complexity, namely we can implement the unit this unitary that generates this basis rotation uh, without any Trotter error uh, in linear depth. Um, and so I have pictorially here going from one set of orbitals to another set of orbitals for kind of a line of hydrogens, and that's what we're going to look at later on. The other nice thing and kind of one of the other components that we need for VQE or really any kind of simulation is extracting the energy or reduced density matrices to get properties. Uh, and for uh, Gaussian states, uh, which these basis rotations are, uh, there's this very nice property that all of their properties are defined just by the second moment. And by the second moment, I'm meaning the one RDM in this case. And so normally you need the full two RDM to evaluate the energy and other properties of your system. But a nice thing about uh, Hartree Fox states or Gaussian states is that uh, you only need the one RDM and the two RDM is just a function, a quadratic function of the one RDM elements. So we're gonna use that to actually minimize the effort uh, for our VQE experiment. Um, later on. And I'll tell you a bit about how we actually measure this, this thing efficiently and do post selection and things like that to account for error. Okay, so what does this implementation look like in Sycamore? And let's start, uh, which is the device we ran this on, and let's start with uh, the circuit. So uh, as I mentioned, this basis rotation that's generated by a quadratic Hamiltonian can be implemented in linear depth. And the thing to remember here is that uh, a Lie algebra that's generated just by these uh, quadratic fermionic operators closes in kind of linear order. And so we can always write a tra unitary transformation or similarity transform of a single fermionic mode uh, as a linear combination of a new linear com uh, a, a new set of fermionic operators. And so this is actually just a basis. This is kind of just the basis rotation that we use to rotate Hamiltonians all the time in quantum chemistry, uh, you know, same as in Hartree Fock or MCSCF. Uh, this, this is the underlying reason, is namely that this, the algebra of this particular set of Hamiltonian closes in polynomial order. Um, and it was actually pointed out, I believe by Peter Poulle uh, a while ago, that you can do effectively a QR decomposition on the unitary generated by exponentiating this kappa matrix. Uh, and what that corresponds to is a sequence of Givens rotations. And so what you can do is just implement this unitary with a sequence of Givens rotations uh, leveraging the group homomorphism property of the one electron uh, algebra. Uh, 
Okay, so what does each of these Givens rotations look like? Uh, if we restrict ourselves to real uh, wave functions, uh, each of these Givens rotations looks like an RY rotation on the 0, 1, 1, 0 subspace of a, of a two, two elect or two qubit uh, uh, Hilbert space. Now, uh, if I want to implement this in terms of gates, what I can think about doing is first I can consider the generator of this rotation in terms of qubits, which looks something like xx plus yy. I can do a fermionic Fourier transform to put this into a diagonal basis, evolve in that diagonal basis, that's these two z terms, and then just go back. Uh, and this pi here is just letting me do a uh, squared I swap dagger. And so that's how we actually compile each of the Givens rotation circuits, or each of the Givens rotations in this circuit, uh, is that we kind of think about it in terms of this kind of firm Fourier, fermionic Fourier transform to a diagonal operator and then evolve in that basis. So kind of very basic physics. Okay. So this is kind of a part that uh, I haven't talked about before uh, in the context of this experiment is how we actually get extremely good performance on our devices. So you should never, if you're a NISC experimenter, you should never kind of take the performance of the device as a given. You know, we have very good calibration tools that are automated, um, but you should always kind of go and calibrate yourself. And so one way that you could actually do that uh, is with a tool called robust phase estimation. And I'm going to describe it first in the context of this uh, single, this Givens rotation, uh, and then I'll just kind of allude to the more general picture. So uh, I explained here that each Givens rotation between each pair of qubits kind of looks like an RY rotation on the 0, 1, 1, 0 subspace. So we can think of that as kind of a logical RY on this subspace. And then we can use robust phase estimation, single qubit type robust phase estimation, to uh, calibrate what exactly this theta is. So the way that robust phase estimation works and most phase estimations work uh, is that you're kind of trading off exponential circuit depth. And I put exponential kind of in quotes here because you can maybe fast forward pieces of it. Um, and then you can measure in the X and Y axis. So one way to look at this RY rotation is to consider the block circle in the X, Z axis. So a, a rotation in that axis, you can think of setting up two, an, your initial state as two, a superposition of two uh, eigenvectors in X and Z your rotation will produce a phase between them. And then to measure how far you rotated, you can just measure in the projection onto the X and Y axis. That exactly gives you the angle that you actually rotated by. Now, by applying this, this operator uh, an exponentially or different number, a different number of times that are spaced out exponentially, effectively what you can learn is one bit of the phase uh, for each uh, kind of application of your unitary that's log spaced. And so this is actually how you get a Heisenberg scaling kind of estimation of the angle. So the kind of scenario that I've painted isn't exactly what we have on the device. Of course, we're not implementing exactly this RY rotation on the 0, 1, 1, 0 subspace. Uh, we're actually implementing something that's closer to what I have written here. Uh, and so what I'm going to kind of allude to next is that we can generalize this idea of setting up these correct superpositions of initial states evolving by our gate and then measuring kind of generalized X and Y operators. Okay, so starting with this gate description here, right? Uh, we can actually map that into a model of what's going on in our circuit. And so we get this from actually modeling of, of our transponds that have this uh, tunable coupler. And we know that as we perform the gate, uh, other kind of property, or other types of kind of interactions can come in from modeling, and this is what that, that actually looks like. So we have Z rotations before the S squared I swap, we have a C phase that's kind of always on in our, in our experiment, and then following Z interactions with uh, the same phase and different phases. And so now our goal is to design a similar phase estimation procedure that we can learn all of these parameters at Heisenberg scaling. And so uh, Zhang Zhang in the Hubbard model experiment very nicely put this in the appendix about how to write down these generalized kind of X and Y experiments, namely to kind of trace out a single qubit version of this kind of generalized model and then uh, use something like the robust phase estimation to learn each of these parameters. And since we're learning these parameters as a where the error is going on one over uh, the number of applications, which we're spacing out logarithmically, we have Heisenberg scaling. And this lets us kind of calibrate the device faster than drift. So you can see down here, 
Uh, the square root I swap uh, theta angle is actually pretty stable, but you can see that there are different uh, phases that are oscillating a little bit here on our device. And by being able to calibrate these very quickly, we can actually make the adjustments on the fly. And so that's actually one of the things that we can do. Uh, there's actually a new tool that's available in our API that actually lets users do this as well. And so it'll let you benchmark exactly in this way, exactly this type of gate, um, and then you'll be able to kind of make adjustments uh, as you run your device or as you run your circuit. Okay, so the next part, that's the circuit, uh, is how do we get information out? And that's the measurement bit. So we know that we're going to have to measure the one RDM. Uh, maybe all of you know that Hardry Fock, which is this given this basis rotation uh, kind of VQE, you can, uh, well, actually it was Paul Dirac who just formulated all of this in terms of the one RDM. And so we're gonna need to measure all, all of these correlators, these kind of IJ correlators in terms of fermionic modes. And if I was to translate this directly from a Jordan Wigner picture, I would get these long Z strings between uh, each of my sigma plus and sigma minus terms. And so that's not actually something that I want. I know that uh, measurement is actually the longest operation on my, um, it's the longest time timeline operation. So it takes about a microsecond to actually measure. And so I'm actually suffering a lot of T1 in that time. And so uh, the longer kind of operator, the longer in terms of many body order operators that I need to measure from a qubit perspective, the more error I'm actually introducing into my measurement. Okay. So the way that we get around this is uh, kind of the following protocol. And I'm going to describe this protocol by kind of painting this picture first of what we can measure from just one permutation of the qubits. So let's say I start out with a single permutation of maybe all my qubits in this line la labeled one to six. And then I do my basis rotation circuit. And at the end, I measure everything in the X or Y basis. So I measure all X's and then I measure all Y's. What that actually lets me do is it lets me measure all nearest neighbor term correlators, namely all one off diagonal elements of the one RDM at one in one shot from just measuring all of X and all of Y. So that's really nice. Uh, I get all of these correlators by measuring in this in just the X basis and then Y basis. Uh, but how do I deal with now the other off diagonal elements? There's N choose two off diagonal elements in a matrix, right? And so I'm measuring N minus one, uh, you know, terms at a time. And so I need N different permutations to use this trick. So what I can do now is kind of swap the qubits or using or swap the fermionic modes such that I have a new ordering such that when I use the same measure in X and measure in Y, I get a different set of off diagonal elements. And I can keep doing this N times to get all of them. Okay, so what I've done now is I've, I've kind of increased my circuit length by adding these swaps at the end. And certainly you can do that. But what I'm gonna do is use a pro the property that uh, the one particle basis transformations have this group homomorphism and the fact that, sorry for that back and forth, um, the fact that these fermionic swap operators are just another firm single particle basis rotation, such that I can actually ro pull those back into my original basis rotation. And what this is effectively doing is it's permuting the rows of the unitary that's I'm using to generate this you know, single particle basis rotation. So I can do that n times to measure all n choose two element off diagonal elements of my one RDM. And the final ingredient of this is actually post-selecting. Namely, I want to be able to post-select for particle number on the entire one RDM. Um, and the way that we think about doing that is remember that these, these kind of uh, nearest neighbor terms are look like XX plus YY in the Jordan Wigner picture. Um, we remember from compiling our Givens rotations that we know that we can diagonalize that term with a, something that looks like a fermionic Fourier transform and then evolve in the eigenbasis. Well, we can just do half of that here. Namely, we just diagonalize with another single qubit rotation with namely, our, uh, or just a single qubit fermionic operator, which is just a T gate and a squared I swap. And so this rotates this into uh, each of the pairs of qubits into the Z basis and lets us actually do this measurement and post-select on particle number, since each of these operators actually commute with the total number operator. So doing this is actually really important. Uh, like I said earlier, if you don't post-select on particle number, uh, one, you're losing electrons. And so that's a pretty big source of error because each electron is contributing quite a bit of energy. Um, and so you're definitely going to need to account for this. And almost all of the NISC experiments that we've seen account for this in some way. 
Um, and this is just a schematic of what you might expect to see in terms of the difference. This gray, these gray curves are the probability of measuring a one from verse of the ideal minus what we actually get from the measured. And the fact that this is positive means that uh, we're actually decaying to zero. So you can see that in terms of the differences of the uh, actual measurements that we get. If we do this post-selection, uh, this kind of distribution uh, looks a little bit more normal instead of skewed a skewed distribution. So that's actually a very nice correction that we can get. Okay, so the last part of what our uh, we're going to need in terms of error mitigation is, uh, well, accounting for what I'll call T2 errors. So one thing that we can look at is we know that we're going to have a lot of T1 errors and we're accounting for that from post-selection. We're going to have T2 errors and so those we can think of as stochastically applying Z operators in, in our circuit. And so uh, what's a good way to account for those? Well, uh, one thing that I'm going to use and kind of lean on is the geometry of these 1RDMs. These 1RDMs are idempotent operators. They're projectors uh, onto a single particle basis. Um, they have fixed trace and they're positive semi-definite. And so what we're going to do is actually apply a McWheeney purification to this operator, which actually just maps the eigenvalues back to zero or one of this particular operator. Now you can't do this in general. And uh, there have been a couple of papers recently that try to do this for more sophisticated systems. And I really want to emphasize that this is not necessarily, this is not something that you can do beyond two qubits um, or two electrons, sorry. Uh, you can do something that has a little bit more generality and use kind of an ensemble RDM approach to kind of do this projection. Um, but if you're going to use a purification that looks like McQueenie, you're going to have to generalize this in some way to higher order density matrices. And as far as I know, that hasn't been written down. So I caution everyone from just taking the procedure in the Hartree-Fock paper uh, and applying that to an arbitrary chemical system. It should be known that this is not uh, this is an erroneous application of that theory. Okay. So uh, what do we do? So to benchmark the device, I'm going to do a series of experiments where I measure the energy of, or potential energy curves of dilating hydrogen chains. And all of the circuits uh, look like this, namely they're this basis rotation and they're a sequence of squared eye swaps uh, with local RZs in between them. So we actually have no microwave gates, which is quite a blessing. Uh, microwave gates are just another degree of control. We have voltage offsets for the RZs, uh, which is a much higher fidelity type thing that we can do. And so uh, just looking kind of at, at a series of these experiments, we can start with uh, six qubits and, or a six hydrogen chain, uh, and then eight, uh, 10 and 12. And the number of qubits here directly maps onto the number of hydrogens because one, I'm working at a minimal basis, and two, I'm only doing this basis rotation in one of the spin sectors. Namely, I'm assuming a restricted Hartree-Fock formalism here. Namely, the spin up sector orbitals look exactly the same as the spin down uh, orbitals. And so normally you, you know that there's a mapping to spin orbitals from qubits. Uh, and so you expect twice the number of spatial orbitals, but here we're just doing a calculation on, in terms of the qubits count is the number of spatial orbitals because of this restriction. And so we can actually try various error mitigation strategies first using, or looking at the performance without this post-selection and this purification and VQE, and then slowly laying them on to understand how we're actually mitigating error at each step. And so these circuits actually range from 18 square root I swaps up to 72 square root I swaps. And of course, these are all linear depth and the number of qubits. Um, I think it's probably important to point out that this is uh, about 10 times the number of two qubit gates as previous chemistry experiments and double the number of qubits. Um, we're not actually simulating something correlated, but I think the jump between to something correlated from here is actually not that large. Remember how I was saying that uh, the full, if we were to implement the full FSIM gate, namely having the C phase interaction in between, uh, that would be a fully interacting model. And that's actually exactly what's done in the Hubbard model paper. And so being able to calibrate these kind of circuits, uh, it's not a huge stretch to go beyond to some co interesting correlated dynamics. Uh, here, we're just going to look at, uh, we're not going to look at dynamics, uh, but we're going to look at uh, ground state energies. 
Okay, so let's take a zoom in on that uh, six qubit experiment. One of the nice properties of looking at Gaussian states is that we actually can get an idea of what the fidelity is of our system without running something like randomized benchmarking in a fermionic mode picture. Um, and the way to do that uh, is actually outlined in a paper from Jens Eisert uh, in 2018. And what they propose is something called a fidelity witness. A fidelity witness is an operator that uh, when you measure it, lower bounds the fidelity. So uh, this is not the fidelity, it's a strict lower bound. And of course, when the fidelity gets worse, uh, this is not a tight estimate of the fidelity. Um, in fact, it can be negative sometimes. Uh, the way that it's actually measured is uh, we use the fact that uh, we can, well, we use the fact that we can actually rotate the state, the one RDM after uh, the, after measuring it. Uh, namely, we have this isomorphism between unitaries that act on two to the N versus act on N by N matrices, right? Or sorry, homomorphism that acts between those two things. And so uh, what we're able to do is actually rotate our one RDM that we measure back into a diagonal basis and actually look at the difference of the occupation numbers. And that is actually what our fidelity witness is. Thus, we have a very large sensitivity to loss of photons. And so that's why post-selecting here is a very important step. Okay. So if we're just to look at the raw numbers coming out of our device, uh, we see that the fidelities actually follow very closely from the estimates that one would get from looking at the supremacy or the quantum supremacy experiment fidelities. Um, and so this is nice. Uh, in some sense, it means that we're getting very good performance uh, for these types of circuits that are unstructured or that are structured versus unstructured circuits. Um, but we still are observing exponential decay in fidelity with circuit depth. Uh, you're not going to get around that without some type of you know, intermediate measurement or some type of very clever post-processing. So let's try to be clever with our post-processing. Um, of course, I described how to measure the entire one RDM uh, with post-selection. And we, like I said, for this fidelity witness, when you account for photon loss, you get a pretty large boost in the perceived fidelity. Right, we're already up to 90% for a six qubit system and for the largest system, 12 qubits, we're up to 65% fidelity. Uh, I described, I talked a little bit about how purification will account for T2 errors. Kind of the way that this works is that if you imagine a stochastic uh, Z ch error channel, right, it's stochastically putting Zs into your circuit as you run it, right? Well, what's that do what that is actually doing is it's actually kind of producing a linear combination of different basis rotation circuits, such that when you purify, you're projecting to the highest weight one. And so that's how I'm actually taking care of T2 in this case. This of course is not a general procedure, but that's just the interpretation of what's going on. And that accounts for a large fidelity loss. And then finally, if we actually apply VQE, um, we can see further improvements. And this is actually relaxing the coefficients uh, to be variationally optimized to account for errors further. And so I think it's important to point out that for the six qubit experiment, we're getting three nines of fidelity. And for the 12 qubit experiment, which has 72 squared I swaps, we're getting uh, two nines of fidelity at the end. Uh, and we're still barely reaching chemical accuracy uh, for H12. And so I'm putting up here the performance for each type of error mitigation. Um, we see the energy, of course, uh, is improved by each error mitigation technique. And the fidelity is actually staying constant as we expect, right? Um, but we're getting pretty good improvement in terms of the uh, infidelity here. But we're barely reaching accuracies needed even at two nines applying all of these tricks. So I think this is kind of a cautionary tale at least. Um, and so you should be able to get to infidelities of 10 to the minus two uh, with tricks like this uh, and running kind of order 100 two qubit gates, which I think is a very nice place to be. And you can start testing some inter very interesting dynamics here. Okay, so our all-in performance, uh, this is kind of getting to the conclusion part uh, of this talk. Um, I wanted to briefly touch on kind of what was one of the underlying motivating factors. And so uh, we've been looking at potential energy curves for uh, binding of molecules, namely looking at their thermodynamics of, uh, or their energy, or their heats of formation effectively. Uh, but really what we want to do with chemistry is look at their energetics in terms of forming and breaking bonds, uh, maybe between two different uh, conformers of a molecule. And so this, the picture, the system that we selected to kind of study uh, 
is a diazine system that's undergoing a transformation from a cis configuration where the hydrogens are the same side of the nitrogens to trans configuration we're on different sides. And there's two potential pathways for this. One, you could imagine dihedrally rotating from the cis uh, configuration all the way to the trans. And since you know that there's a double bond here in this nitrogen, you expect to be breaking that bond and you expect actually the di at a single, in a single reference theory, you're going to have a discontinuity up here in your energy surface, right? Where you switch your preferred single determinant uh, representation. And then there's another pathway where we're actually swinging the hydrogen out kind of along the side of the nitrogen, right? And part of the reason we picked this uh, is that there's a pretty large gap here of about 40 millihartries in in kind of this basis. And so it'll let us resolve this difference. Um, but it's not, this is not the correct ordering of, of these. And it's just to point out, I I'm putting this out now just to say that the goal of this experiment was not to reproduce the actual chemistry of the experiment, it's to reproduce the model. Uh, because our goal, of course, is to kind of study these basis rotation primitives and what circuit calibration techniques that we can come up with applying to these, these types of systems. So kind of when we use post-selection, our purification and variational relaxation of the parameters, we actually can get this kind of this particular mechanism pretty well. Um, and we actually agree with the model chemistry. And so I think this is a pretty large departure from a lot of the previous uh, experiments that have, you know, maybe large kinks in their energy surfaces or some other kind of fairly erroneous factors uh, that aren't actually built in in a knowledgeable way to the circuit or Hamiltonian. And so uh, hopefully uh, when you guys all run experiments, uh, this is this is combining these types of strategies. This is kind of the accuracy that, that one can expect. So uh, I know I'm a bit early, but I, I think this is it's good to kind of open it up for questions. Uh, let me summarize here in terms of kind of what we've learned and, and what we did. So this was the largest chemistry experiment to date uh, by a lot, uh, but it's only 12 qubits uh, and it, it's, you know, double or it's about 10 times the number of two qubit gates, but it's still not a lot compared to implementing a unitary couple cluster step or a full trotter step, for example. And so we can use the techniques that I described, this calibration technique, uh, some of the post-selection techniques and maybe variations of purification. And we can probably scale to 20 qubits or so for our next, next experiments. Um, but going beyond that with current error rates is going to be pretty challenging. Um, so when you design an experiment, uh, you should have error mitigation in mind and you should have ways to address each of the large error channels. Uh, and so quite often uh, we see that uh, people have really great experimental ideas, um, but the error mitigation component uh, is less developed and having kind of a very strong strategy going in on how to address those is, is something that uh, kind of very naturally leads to a strong experiment. Uh, I also wanted to advertise a little bit of work about generalizing uh, the measurement scheme that I described as virtual swapping. So I described how you can kind of permute the basis, this, the basis of your, that you're using um, to measure different elements of the RDMs. Uh, we actually generalize this fully and get optimal scaling for uh, measuring the RDMs in terms of the swap network approach. Uh, but this was actually beat, in fact, beat pretty badly by a Fermi, uh, classical shadows approach. And so we generalized the kind of quantum classical shadows to a fermionic version uh, in this paper. And uh, the last thing is, again, I wanna emphasize that you can't generalize McWini purification uh, verbatim from the paper. Uh, or you can't take it verbatim from this paper that we published and apply it to systems beyond two electrons. Uh, there's other ways that one can, can do purification. In fact, James Whitfield did a lot of his postdoc work on looking at uh, generalized poly constraints and pinning. And uh, of course, it's an ongoing area of research to understand how we can actually apply those for error mitigation. And lastly, of course, we did all of these simulations in CERC and Open Fermion. These are open source packages that uh, we're happy to accept contributions to. And uh, thank you for your time and your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Nick. That was a really excellent talk. Great, sum great summary of the work. Um, so I think there's one question in the, in the Slack uh, from Javi. Do you want to ask that? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, Nick. 
Thanks for the talk. It was great to understand everything from the Hartree Fog experiment. Once and for all, I think. I hope. Uh, yeah, my question was uh, about this uh, RPE, the, the robust, phase, robust phase estimation. I didn't, it wasn't clear to me if you run the robust phase estimation before you run the experiment or you gather the information for the robust phase estimation while you're measuring the terms of the two, of the one RPM and then do the, the optimization or, or, or whatever gets involved in that. Is it the first or the second? Do you first do, run uh, the It's the first one. So we're calibrating. Okay. So we're calibrating first and then uh, we're running the experiment. And so in reality, uh, maybe I can, if I can go back to this slide, uh, if you were to write this in terms of gates, right, you can have kind of full moments where you're just running square root iSwaps in one moment, and then a moment where you're just running Zs, and then a next moment you're running square root iSwaps, right? Namely, the waveforms in the FPGAs are all synchronized to be running two cubic gates at once, and then single cubic gates, and then two cubic gates, and so on. And, you know, that model that we have for the interaction comes from our knowledge of uh, the gate physics and and potential crosshawk terms, or it's not crosshawk terms, but uh, just the potential gate physics here. And so, if we are very careful in terms of calibration, running these beforehand, uh, and our experiments are quick enough, then we can get in before this drift time. In fact, for the experiment, we we actually ran, did some other things to actually try to minimize this drift. Um, you see it's fairly regular, um, and we can isolate sources in the lab that are are causing that. And so um, it doesn't, it, I, I don't want, I didn't really emphasize that because I didn't want to kind of maybe give people the impression that you need to be in our lab to get very good fidelities. Um, but we do have tools to be able to assess this drift very, very quickly such that you can actually integrate that back uh, into a circuit compilation that you have. Yeah, that answers my question. Um, I was just wondering if you could run some of the information that you gather on a VQE-like setup. But yeah, like, so like you could. So, yeah, so I guess maybe another way to interpret that question is like, how much information can you get about these parameters from the RDM, right? Sure. From the one RDM that you measure, and actually, you can get all the parameter information from the one RDM plus the extra measurements that you're doing. So the one RDM measurement, you're actually throwing away a bunch of me measurement information. Um, but if it's just from the one RDM, you actually don't have enough information because measuring these X or Ys would be measuring the expectation value of just like a raising operator and lowering operator. And so the one RDM doesn't tell you that expectation. It's actually the extra information from the measurements that you're maybe not including in the one RDM that tell you that. Okay, yeah, cool. All right, thanks for the question, Javi. Um, there's a follow, there's another question by Yaroslav. You know, go for it, Yaroslav. Uh, oh, okay, maybe I can ask like right that. Okay, so uh, I was wondering about this uh, particle number post selection technique, which is, I guess, I mean, naturally it's only available for fermions. So imagine you're trying to simulate the spin system. How much do you lose in terms of the available circuit depths and the system size if you don't have that? Uh, I guess it depends kind of what. Say VQ, VQ simulate. Let's say we talk oh. about VQ simulation. I mean, I think I think you'll suffer quite a lot if you're not accounting for the largest known source of error, which is T1 decay in your measurement. Like our, our measurements are very fast, especially with, you know, developing that technology for our error correction experiments. Uh, but it's still one of the longer gate operations. Our two cubic gates are 12 nanoseconds. Uh, our physical Zs are like on the order of 40 nanoseconds. And then readout is hundreds, well, there are optimized readouts is hundreds of nanoseconds. In the cloud, you'll get something that's closer to, you know, maybe a microsecond. And so that's a lot of T1 decay. Uh, our, the T1 of our qubits is, is not, you know, crazy long. It's good, but it's not, it's not like something that's outstanding and you're never gonna observe T1. So you'll still be hit by that pretty large error. But but that let's say could be uh, substituted maybe by a parity uh, post selection if that's if that's uh, possible, right? Yeah, if you have like a well, if you have a global any U one symmetry uh, oh. is kind of, so full particle number selection is a U one symmetry, and so anytime parity is kind of like that, and so you can if you can use that, then you'll be accounting for a lot of particle loss. You could also do something kind of like Tom's RPE or Tom's uh, VPE, uh, which would also kind of handle, I think, particle loss in a slightly different fashion. But 
uh, that would account for it as well. Mm, sure, yeah, right. Yeah. Kind, of curious, okay, cool. kind of curious, Nick, just to follow up on that question, do you have any idea like what the relative, um, what the relative uh, gain in error mitigation is selecting on number in the hartree fock experiment versus if you, did you ever look at what would happen if you just selected on the parity? Oh, uh, no, I didn't look at just parity. Um, I guess there, so there's one aspect of this experiment that I kind of, looking back, I wish I did, which was to kind of permute the types of error mitigation that we're adding, mm -hmm. right? So like, instead of just doing them sequentially, adding them, you know, one after another, uh, which was a very natural thing to do, uh, let's just do one or maybe a pair and then a different pair and then, you know, so on, right? So it's hard for me to kind of guess which ones, how each one plays together. Um, but certainly it's kind of very clear when you stack rank the fidelity improvement from each of the the, the things, if you expect them to be kind of fairly constant, then I'd expect, you know, for post-selection, you get a pretty big jump, but purification is of course by, by far the largest uh, because projecting back to a pure state is, is a pretty powerful technique. Yeah, right, right. That's good. That's a, yeah, it's good, to, good food for thought. Um, and then I think there's one more question in the chat from Luke. Yeah, this is more, more a bit, uh, I mean, as a quantum chemist, I mean, Hartree Fock, we, we, we usually don't think so much about because it's so easy and we can do it for very large systems. But in, in realistic quantum chemistry, we actually have a more interesting case where you basically have a min-max uh, min optimization where you maximize in, in the number of degrees of freedom and minimize in others uh, because you also degree, uh, deal with um, the positronic uh, degrees of freedom uh, if you solve the, for the Dirac equation rather than the Schrodinger equation. So basically, and and in a, in a way, you see that also electronically excited states, where you, you may want to optimize on a, uh, uh, say, a first order settle point. Have you, have you thought about that? I mean, could you tweak things that that you could do that as well? Uh, I have not personally thought about it. I mean, I certainly know that they, these are things that one would need to do to actually get quantitative chemistry. Um, mm -hmm how different they would look in the, the context of a NISC, NISC experiment versus classical, which I think is probably the important thing since you yeah. know, there are people who are experts in doing the classical side. Uh, I'm not convinced, I'm not sure how different it would be. Certainly there's, there's other ways that we might imagine measuring forces or something like that. Um, but if you need properties, like full properties of the RDM or kind of state average versions, it's still like a lot of measurements to run and maybe there are some tricks you can play in a NISC setting to get more, aggregate more information. But a lot of the techniques about, you know, evaluating things in the AO basis because preventing your, you know, which would prevent you from having to do an extra orbital rotation, uh, you probably aren't going to do. You're probably going to put everything into the MO basis, which adds to the classical complexity, but we almost never consider that as a real problem in, in quantum computing. So, no, I, um, I, exactly. That's how I went to, and so, so, so this is what I thought. Ah, it's interesting. They that don't have to be fucked with. I mean, are we going to use it in, in practice? I mean, that that's kind of. Uh, yeah. yeah, I did. This is like a very weird version of Hartree Fock, right? Yeah. It's kind of the canonical transform version. I see yeah. Steve's on the call, and so I think he was the one who pointed this out that you could actually perform Hartree Fock this way in his uh, canonical transform paper, and. Uh, we, you know, we start from the core orbitals. Uh, we can start from any other set of orbitals, but we just pick core orbitals and then do the rotation. And we just optimize uh, with, we optimize in a way that, uh, again, we're leveraging this, well, we're doing a second order step or approximate a second order step, just like you do an orbital rotation in MCSCF. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all of that infrastructure is kind of the same. Yeah, okay, thanks.